Hi, welcome to the session today. My name is Ruben Miller. I'm a principal consultant at Software AG and also the author of the Go CAY CLI console program. So my session today is Commonwealth Loves CLI, bringing Commonwealth to the console. So now you might ask, console, a little bit scary, why not just use Postman? So Postman is the classic way that someone starts experiencing the Commonwealth API. So everyone knows it has a nice friendly UI, which is really inviting at first, um, but it has one major problem. So let's look at a workflow. So for example, we want to create one device. Okay, easy, one command, all good. Let's create an alarm for it. Still not so bad, but I still have to copy the device ID to the alarm uh, before I create it and put it in the body. Um, but let's extend that and say, okay, let's do 100 devices because I don't think anyone's wanted to create one device in their life. Um, so repeating the same workflow in Postman for 100 devices just doesn't scale. And then maybe you have a colleague that comes to you and go, ah, oh, great, I saw your setup after you finished 100 devices. I have another tenant. Can you please redo it there? And you go, no, it, it doesn't work. So sorry, Postman. It's good for beginners and UI people, but for professionals, it's just not good enough. So what I want to show is a different way of doing Commonwealth API interactions. So using it on the command line. The command line is a tried and tested format for interacting with anything, whether it's writing scripts, um, starting scripts, programs, uh, what a, a API, if you've used curl in the past, then you've used the command line. So I want to show you what possibilities are available and how that can scale to basically anything to create 3 million devices. So first, what exactly is it? So Commolocity, so I've called it CAY, so it's a single binary. Um, you can run it on any operating system you would like. So Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, there's a, a different binary for each of those platforms. Uh, and then we also support some tab completion in different shell platforms uh, where you can use Z shell, Fish, Bash, or PowerShell, where you can get really harness the powers of doing dynamic tab completions for device names or application names uh, or you know the arguments which you don't get in Postman. Um, so here in the screenshot, it shows a great example how one of these workflows could look like. So it gets a list of devices updates a fragment on each of those devices and then passes the results and creates an operation on each of the input ones. So because it's command line utility, which accepts native pipelines, uh, you can basically chain to your heart's content. So you can uh, also connect to any kind of third party tools. As long as it's producing some output, um, you can feed it into the input and then do whatever complex workflow you have. So to break it down, what is each command actually doing? So each command is compiled with different arguments. So here on the left side, we have Comlocity alarms create. What does it do? It creates alarms. Um, it has additional flags, which is with the dash dash uh, nomenclature, uh, where you could then provide the different properties, which then get mapped to an API request. So in this case, because it's a underlying post request to create an alarm, it's then mapping those arguments to the body. It's not always mapping to the body. It depends on the command because obviously there's also uh, parts where you map the IDs to the path variable. For example, like instead of alarms, alarms, you'll have a forward slash ID or whatever that is also handled. As well as parsing the command line arguments, we also then can transform pipe input into API requests, whether it's you can then do pre-configured API requests in some kind of third party application or in some JSON file that you prepared yourself and then feed it in to Commolocity CLI tool and it will then generate all the requests for you. 
Now, sending commands is not really, you don't win too much with that. I mean, that's not very interesting in the long, um, it's not very moving us forward here because in the end, you could just do everything in curl if you wanted. Um, so I also provide a lot of features which then are meant to complement the underlying sending of the commands. One of my main motivations for writing this tool was to enable automation. A lot of the time, a lot of the past projects I worked for, I find my, found myself doing the same things over and over and over again, that I had to send some custom commands, so I write a Python script, or some people write a JavaScript, or JavaScript and Java, um, or whatever programming language they're familiar with, and it's just doing the same thing. You always have to do the same session logging, um, log outputs, and all of these kind of additional overhead that it just takes time to implement and everyone does it differently, so there's no kind of normalized way of doing things. Then I want first class support with pipeline. So pipeline is basically where you can feed the output of one command, it doesn't have to be Comelocity, it could be any other command, uh, into the Comelocity command and then to do your request. That makes binding to any third party tools or existing bash scripting possible. So you can then pipe it to grep and do whatever kind of magic you want there. And then the output then create the operation or remove the alarm or whatever. Then the command line is very powerful. So with that, you can also then be quite destructive with a lot of things, because if it's so easy to, let's say, create 100 devices and then delete the 100, um, I found that you needed some kind of logging there to make sure um, that you did the right thing, or if you need some kind of retrospectively look at what you did a day ago, that you have it at your fingertips as well, because uh, all of the commands are also logged in the activity log and available through commands. Uh, but in the end, it's just a JSON file. Uh, so you can look up what you did on those days or maybe hunt down when, if you're having a problem, uh, you know, the performance um, times from the responses and how that handles and what was the error codes or if you wanted to track what devices you created and then only delete the devices you created or these kind of things, uh, it's also in the activity log. Then another common feature that everyone tries to do is having sending parallel requests. So using workers to send more than one request. I have this built in, so it's just about adding a new argument. Um, where we can then control how fast the work is done by either scaling up the number of workers. Um, however, we want to do this in a controlled manner. So we also have a delay mechanism where we can restrict how fast the workers then um, move on to the next request because it's all about controlled concurrency. We don't want to then spam the, the platform with 500 million different parallel requests at the same time and expect everything to work. So here it's all about limiting it with purpose and doing it in a very sustainable way. Then in additional, everything in the command line is highly configurable. So whether it's setting default arguments settings or the views that you see, so the data which is presented on the console, um, it all can be configured uh, through JSON configuration files um, to be customized to your need because every IoT project has different requirements. So each user has different information which they're interested in. Now that's enough of looking at PowerPoint slides. Uh, so let's move on to the demo where we can actually see it in live. Um, I want to keep this still a very free flowing demo um, because I think that's part of the idea that I'm trying to sell here is that to show you how easy it is to do stuff that I just think up on the spot. So obviously I prepared a little bit of a rough guide, but we'll see how we go. So I want it full of a few typos and everything to reflect a real world usage. There's no point in me scripting something here because that goes against the point. So let's start off. I mean, the very first thing, so I have a demo tenant here on the left hand side. You can see it's kind of a little bit sad here. There's no devices. OK, so the very first thing I do in Comelocity is create devices. Um, so in this instance, 
if you're not familiar, I'm actually going to create an agent. Um, the difference between the agent and device is just one particular fragment, and agents are allowed to accept operations, where devices alone are not. Um, so let's start off, let's create 100 devices. Okay, so I'll use, first of all, sequence 1 to 100. That is just an inbuilt, so I'm running on Ubuntu system at the moment, so on a Z shell. Um, so sequence is just to generate a range of numbers from 1 to 100, stepping ones. So that's okay. Use that. I'll do my commands. So what do I want to do? I'm going to create. So, um, so I'll just leave it at that. Now, the very first thing, so you'll be prompted. So if you don't use force, you'll be say, hey, are you sure you're doing what you should be doing? Um, there's a few options. You can say yes, yes to all, no, no to all, or whatever. Um, for this instance, I'll just say yes, so I can create them. And then go through, and I've created 100 devices. So let's see what it really looks like in Commodore sitting. So I'm in the all devices view in the device management application. And you see I've created 100 devices. Cool. So, but yeah, the names aren't fantastic. Um, one, yeah, I don't like that very much. So usually if I'm doing like a POC, I want to give them some kind of a little bit more meaningful name. So let's look at maybe adding like a prefix or something. So I'm doing a demo, so let's call it, let's just add demo as a prefix. But this, if you've ever used Postman, this will be going, how is that possible? Um, so with the command line, it's actually quite easy because we respect pipe input. So if I want to do get all of the devices, so because the agents are devices, so I'll use devices because I'm more used to typing that command. Um, so if I do CAY devices list, that will get the list of devices. So that sends basically an API call and gives me the results back. It's showing me a table view. I'll get into that very shortly. So I've focusing on the stuff that I want to see. Um, so I've predefined these views and some sensible defaults, um, but that's basically so you can customize this and only see the interesting parts. Because anyone who's seen the JSON will see that that gets very hard to read over 100 devices, or in this case, only 20 are being shown, um, but that's a lot harder to read. So the table formats a very nice kind of quick overview of what it's doing. Um, and if you really want all the nitty uh, details, uh, you can then use the JSON output. But you'll also notice that it's not showing you currently all of them because the view still applied. But again, I'll get into that shortly. So back to our problem. We want to then add a prefix to the names of 100 devices. So that's super easy. So we'll go devices, list. Because I want to get all of them, I don't want to worry about pagination because pagination is always, it's the other kind of classic thing that when you start doing um, large, uh, operating on large tenants with a large amount of devices, you reach the 2000 pagination limit and you're going, okay, I need to worry about pagination. Here, you don't, I've got to keep it. Include all. It will actually do a very efficient uh, or an optimized query to get all of the devices. And that means all of whether you have um, 100 in our case or 3 million, it will get all of them. Um, so I know for one customer, we currently have about 200,000 uh, and that works quite nicely. Probably takes about three minutes in the end to get all the devices. Uh, and if you do it by the classic pagination method, that takes like 20 minutes. Uh, so what we want to do, we want to pipe all of the results and then, so we want to do an update action. So let's just go devices update. Now this is where a little bit of magic is enabled. So I really want to, so for example, for here on the device one, it has a name called one, but I want to have it called demo underscore one. So I really want to change this one and keep the original one and just prefix a fixed string. So how do I do that? Um, so I support a templating language. Um, it's called JSonnet. It's a unofficial Google product. 
Um, but it's a lot like JSON. So it's not too scary to learn, but you can basically do a, uh, you give it some kind of JSON object. So here I want to, my manipulation is going to be um, just setting the name property, so the name, but I can actually reference for each template the input variable. So for example, so it basically runs an internal for loop. So the first line of the for loop or first iteration of the for loop will have this one. So this object is available within the template. So I'll just do my fixed string at the moment. I'm going to have some line wrapping, but that's OK. Um, so I just want to do a plus because I want to do a string append. Then the input dot value. So the input dot value will be your iterator. Then this gives you full access to whatever you're piping in. So if I wanted to also then add the dot type or something to it, I'll just use dot type. So here I want to prefix a dot name. So that is actually all I need. And because I've been talking about workers so much, let's do some workers. Um, I don't really want a, so those more familiar with the API, uh, sometimes if you set the accept header to nothing, that is actually a little bit more performant, especially if you don't need the response back on the command line or from the request, it's advisable to use that. Um, so we'll just use this because we're being good uh, REST API citizens. And I also want to progress. So, and because I don't want to be annoyed with prompts, I'm just going to use force. Okay. Done. So that was 100 requests. So I split that across five workers. So you can see in the progress bar, um, so it's only shown when you use the progress option, um, you have a few information available to you. Um, so a bit of an elapsed time, it's only showing seconds, so it was faster than a second, so it didn't show anything there. Uh, but I've also had like requests where I um, back it off because in production is usually a little bit more conservative with values. Um, so I've had it running for like five hours or something. Um, and again, it always gives you a bit of a start information so you know you know when it started and um, you know how far along is it, uh, and then also a request counter. Then the individual workers show just a kind of a running um, average requests per second um, to see how it goes. It's an average and it's an estimate. So it'll actually change over time. So it's not including the whole period. So if you're doing 200,000 requests, it's not going to average it out over the 200,000. But it's meant to be there to give you a now status. How's the platform doing with these requests? Do I need to maybe stop it and start again uh, with a backed off delay or whatever? But if we then reload here, perfect. We have demo one, all prefixed. Now, Postman has no chance of doing that. Now, okay, we have our devices. Okay, so what? Um, let's say we want to maybe add a custom fragment to these devices. So I'll do something, uh, a command very similar to before, but I don't know, let's um, add some kind of type. So my custom type. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but maybe back off the delay a bit. Uh, I've got a mistake somewhere in there. Uh, work is to 50 milliseconds. Pause. I have a mistake. I have a missing quote. Yeah, found it. Again, always good to know that experience with command lines. Okay, so I didn't use the progress bar because I just want to kind of see the output as it comes in. You could see it kind of stutter a little bit. That's the 250 uh, millisecond delay that I put in between uh, the workers getting new jobs, etc., uh, to be a bit more of a controlled concurrency there. Okay, so now we've added a fragment called my custom type, but then you might be looking, yeah, but that's not in in the view. Okay, that's not so nice. So. I mean, you, you have two different, you have a few different options available to you. So if you really want some JSON outputs, turn the views off so you then see the full objects. 
But as you can see here, there's always a lot of kind of, um, let's say, boilerplate um, properties that are um, added to each of the devices, which in my experience, you don't often need them, at least if you're just looking at the properties. So that's why the table views are really good. Um, so let's show how to customize a view so you can show the stuff that you want. So all of the views are just JSON files. So they start locally on the platform. So I have another repository which adds all of these add-ons um, where you can basically the views. So I provide a lot of uh, good view templates that you can then use and then customize to your own purposes. So I just created a a custom device agent. So it's just JSON. It's not very scary. Um, there's a few components uh, involved in it. So you give so you can give it an array or you can have it in different files, whatever makes sense for you. Um, so I want to actually customize this view and give it higher priority, well, technically lower, but higher priority of being processed um, when being executed or when it's detected by the command line. So here there's some different command line um, matching criteria that you can implement. So for example, here I'm just using fragments. So this view will be activated if it has a CIY is device. So that's the classic to tell Commodity this managed object is a device. But you can actually add multiple fragments if you want to say, and I hope I have it, no, um, something like device. I'll just save it and look it up shortly. Uh, my custom type. Okay, so I'll just take this and edit my view again. So this view will only be activated if these two fragments are available. Uh, devices list and because I haven't added it here. Live demos. Bingo. So here I didn't need to reload anything because all of the views are loaded at runtime. Uh, so every time the every time you call this, this is running a binary. Um, so it makes it, I mean, there's a bit of overhead when you start things. Um, however, a lot of this flexibility of just loading the views dynamically when you start up is is very nice user experience because you don't have to then activate something else before you see it. So I saw immediate effects um, after editing the file, and now I can see my custom fragment. So at this point, because I just used a fixed value, it's not that interesting, um, but you can customize this for whatever your um, IoT solution looks like. Um, so each of the customers usually have different um, information that they want to display. Uh, so like either IMEI number or whatever, you can add that and prioritize your view above the defaults, and then you can really get something that's useful to you. Now, another interesting or another kind of output format that I support is also CSV. So the views and output formats work kind of together. So the view is basically used to limit the number of properties that you want to see because usually there's like 20, 30 properties and you only want five. Um, so the views are basically automatically selecting only five properties. But if you want to do an ad hoc view, that's also possible. So each of the commands has a select option. So I only want to see the ID and type, maybe name and my custom, Maybe because I'm feeling lazy, I'm just going to use star. Why not? And it also isn't case sensitive, so all good. Um, and we can see that I'm only selecting the stuff that I want. Now, if you go, OK, I want JSON output, you can have JSON output, technically JSON line output, um, but that's more flexible. Um, and it's the same thing. Or if you want CSV, CSV. Is all good because then CSV you can do stuff like for whatever reason if you want to use cut pipe it somewhere and do some filtering and then get the first element you can do that. 
Um, so it's very flexible. Um, you can also store that to file and then pipe in the file and get it. Um, it's all very nice and pipeable. What the views are doing in the background is basically just automatically selecting, uh, selecting properties. So it's basically utilizing the same select mechanism. Um, but the site is very good for ad hoc stuff. So usually I always do like the ID because the ID is king there um, to get reference to an object and, and then whatever properties I need. So if you want everything, you can also use the glob star. So it uses like a path principle. Um, and then if I want to see the JSON and then I see the full objects. Um, so it's completely flexible. And if you don't like colors, then just go with no color, um, classic kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's really flexible. And I find if you're doing stuff on the command line, the table view is usually the, the way to go because you can focus on the things that you really want uh, rather than all of the kind of other, um, in this moment, not very interesting stuff. OK, so we looked at concurrency. Uh, we looked at views, a bit of um, a bit of templating, um, maybe just to show a bit of uh, an example just of what templating and the possibilities available. Um, so here's a bit of more complex JSONnet or JSONnet um, template. From here, you don't really know what it's doing, but let's fix that and add a comment. So um, custom weather, whoops. Okay, cool. So JSON can also do local variables. You can write functions. You can merge JSON objects together. Um, you can even do dynamic properties. For example, here I've created a function where I'm I let it. So I want to uh, specify the type. So the type will then be set into the, um, so that's a local variable, apologies. Um, so here the var is an option that I provide where I allow the user to then override this value or the default value at runtime. So you can keep your templates nice and dynamic or provide availabilities for users to customize it even further. So it will look for the type variable save it in the local variable here, m type, so measurement type, um, and then I can use it wherever I want. So here I'm using it as a value of type, so there'll be weather, and then I'm also using it as a fragment name. So sky's the limit. It's a very, very flexible language, um, and you can also keep it simple. If you're only happy with JSON, then you can write JSON, that's fine. Um, but this format's a little bit more flexible, because um, you don't even have to do a lot of single quotes, double quotes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's much nicer if you're more familiar with JavaScript, um, kind of JSON with trailing commas and everything. Um, then the tool provides a lot of helper functions because having static templates is not very interesting. So I provide a lot of kind of random number generators. So if you just want a random integer, which goes in between 15 and 40, then you just do dot int 40, 15. Then same thing with float, if you want that to say range and how many uh, decimal places you want, uh, it's also available. So how do we use that? So let's save and I didn't save it, but didn't make any, uh, just added the comment. So looking at how you reference the template down. So Let's just get one device. So P1 for page size, that's just the, the shortcut for page size. Um, then I want to create a measurement. So measurements create. Because I have a template, and guess what? Tab completion. Um, let's, so measurement complex. Now, one really important thing is, especially if you're using a lot of external files, you might be thinking, what does it do? Which any good engineer should always question, what does it do? Uh, especially if they're doing it on even a queue system, I would still argue um, you should always be knowingly doing something rather than just playing around. Um, so all of the commands support a dry run. So if I do dry run, 
this is just going to, it's not going to send a command, but it shows you what it will send if you remove drive. Um, so I'm actually rendering the drive format in Markdown. So this makes it really nice to copy and paste to a Confluence page or in some kind of open source um, documentation that you have like a Markdown. Um, so it shows you here, it's sending a post command to this address. So this one is the real, just so you know, because uh, which tenant you're in, for example, um, how, you know, what, what the endpoint is for the actual tenant. Um, but starting from here, I've tried to keep it generic because you might be doing it on a, you're a dev tenant, which might not be available to the customer or, or to another third party. And you just want to send the generic information to them. So you don't want to, you want to kind of restrict your host name. Um, so here it just shows you, it's just a post sending it to this endpoint. It also include the headers. So this is valid Markdown. So it would be nicely presented in Markdown when you render it, um, showing what kind of accept header you need, the authorization, because I have logging as hide sensitive information because I don't want to show everyone my password. Um, it'll show you what kind of um, authorization is required here. Um, so base 64 with tenant, username, password, and content type, et cetera. Then here shows you the body that it's using. So here's really good to see what the template is actually doing. Um, so I can see, you know, is it doing what I expected? Barometer pressure, okay, yeah, that's oh, cool. We said it was like between 980 and uh, 1030 or something. Um, temperature, because it's Brisbane, so it's nice and warm there. Um, that's all good. Cool, and then I can see my CAY weather type there and there. Nice. But how does it look like when we, let's use a template variable because it was referencing one. So this also has tab completion. I just tab, so if there's more than one parameter um, or like input template variable, uh, you will see that in the list. Um, but here there's only one, so it automatically selected that. Um, let's do my app and then it's changed to my app. So the advantage of the templates, you can still hold it very dynamic. So you can allow runtime users to do it without then you don't even need to write your own command to do this. So the classic way I did this in the past with an earlier version was I always wrote a dedicated then command, which did this particular function. Um, However, it was a lot of effort for just changing the body and having one input argument. Um, so that's why I really push to make it flexible and give the option that you can then add stuff on the fly and make it into your template. So if we then add this, so let's pick out one device. Let's not, so let me get a bit more green real estate. So let's not do a list now. I want to pick out what device I want to use. Uh, oh, something. Idea one, cool. Tap completion. Then let's get rid of the drive because I actually want to do it. Thing because I didn't use force. That's all good. Created. Cool. So let's go here just to double check and how that looks like in real life. Probably won't see much. Uh, you can kind of see it there. But let's, let's do another one. Okay. I'm not really liking this having to repeat everything. Uh, so let's change that. So I used a, because everything's pipe, I have a few utility functions. So I have a CAY util repeat. What does it do? It repeats. Basically it repeats whatever input it gets X number of times. So in this case, 10. And I also, as another global variable, um, I have, like I said before, I have a delay, which, you know, control a little bit of the workers. Um, but I also have a delay before, so you can, at some instances, you want to do the delay before you send it on or afterwards. Um, there's use cases for both. Um, so in this case, we're saying, okay, before you send and create a measurement, 
give me two seconds time um, to then react. Uh, maybe if I want to load a page or something first and then get the first measurement, um, it's totally up to you. You can use it however you want. Um, and then because it repeated 10 times, so each time it then basically passes on the same device as a kind of like a drip, drip every two seconds. Um, and then yeah, passes it to the measurement create, and then we see it here. Let's do that. Then if I am able to zoom in on the content, still rendering out a view, that's fine. Yeah, so it's a very flexible way, and because I turned off real time, when did I do that? Scroll back a little bit, because I was talking. Okay. Yeah, so that's a very quick way I've been able to create devices, create um, measurements for them in space and no time. I didn't need to write a microservice. I didn't need to write my own script. Um, you just have to kind of have a look at it, what uh, commands are available. Um, and But once you get a feel for it, everything is uh, very consistent. Um, so if you've used one, you can then extrapolate to other commands because there's a lot of global parameters like the template that's supported by everything. Um, so you can use it however you want there. Now, one thing that we haven't really we kind of sort of a little bit of the nice ta um, tab completion stuff, um, but pretty much everything is tab completion. So whether it be fixed arguments or actual um, dynamic arguments. So let's have a look at, let's get the applications. If I tab, I don't only get like the application name, what kind of type it is. So is it hosted or not, uh, and the ID. Okay, cool. I could either just type here because I can see the idea, ID, or if we go to administration, we get the administration app. So what's happening also in the background is that for a lot of the ID parameters or flags, it does a lookup for you. Because a lot of the instances, everyone uses the ID like a semi-unique number. Um, so it adds a bit of flexibility that if you're being lazy, you can then reference uh, stuff by names instead of IDs. Uh, but obviously, if you're doing stuff in production, I only use IDs because I want to be 100% sure that I'm working with the object I think I'm working with. Um, but that's also part of the reason why a lot of in the prompts, um, especially if you change stuff. So if I want to update the application, um, I don't know, Give it a custom fragment, why not? I go here, it gives me, hey, this is ID three, the name administration on this tenant. Are you sure you want to do that? And maybe you know the IDs. Well, if you start working with the platform a lot, you get to know the IDs um, or the fact that it's three, it's an inbuilt rather than a higher number. Um, it's meant to give you a quick indication and sanity check before you do something. So you can actually disable all of the confirmation prompts um, or only confirm for delete if you want. Um, that's up to you. Um, however, I would recommend leave it because I am always a fan of opting into something on purpose. So not just assuming that um, you, know, you won't be prompted or that it's doing the right thing. So if you want it to be forced, then give it a dash F. And it's only two characters extra. Um, but the command line completion goes even further. So we saw we created a few measurements before. So we have a look at the measurements and we want to say list, why not device, uh, the demo one. So I have some new results. Um, then value fragment type. App. Nice. So I didn't I didn't paste that. That just came up because it's all in the background a supported fragments um, command for you. So you don't even need to look up what I had before you do it. And then see for the series, 
because I've given it a device and I'm only working with one device, you'll say, oh, okay, I know where to get this information from. I'll look it up for you on the fly. Um, and then you can just choose whatever one you want there. So that's super handy and that's pretty much for everything. So um, there's a lot of instances that even if you're playing around pen and options, get the category, tab, tab, tab. And pretty much just tab and it'll come up for you. Um, so that's also very flexible and it just makes the whole experience much nicer and much quicker to you know look at what you're doing. Then so touching on some of the other features like the activity log we spoke about before. So let's have a look at that. And so there's only one list. So how long did I do that? About 10 minutes? Yeah, I'm not. Cool. What commands did I do in the last 10 minutes? You can actually specify a date if you want. Um, but here I, so let's just make that a bit bigger. So here you get a little bit of more information because my screen's bigger. Um, you can see the path query, but the same rules apply. So if you want to see something that you only a specific property or something, like for example, response times in milliseconds, star ms, because I know the name and you can use wildcards here. Um, so I can see that kind of monitor how much the um, the response times were, but to be honest, that's a little bit unfair because it's basically combining multiple types of commands. And if I'm doing a query, that's obviously going to be more than a post or, or vice versa, depending on the platform. So you can also by do some client side filtering, which is supported on every command. So if we say method equals what was it, post and have a look at the path, uh, method. Um, so I can see all of these commands and then do some kind of averaging or whatever um, you want to it. Very powerful. And this is just um, basically viewing into a JSON file um, that exists. So you can also do activity log and you can see then the, the file where it's stored. Um, by default, it is storing um, it per day or whatever. Uh, so you can, it's highly configurable. You can configure it however you want. You can even turn it off if you want, but I would recommend leave it on. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, and it will basically save, save very difficult situations at some time where you need to trace back when did something break. Um, like with your application, if you're doing custom um, commodity uh, microservice calls or something that you can see uh, these, at these instances, I got a non-201 request or something back. Um, that is all booked, um, which I've used personally in production systems quite um, frequently, debugging stuff. It's, it's a fantastic tool. Um, so again, with the, the highly customization, so everything, can be configured because everything's driven by a settings file. Um, so maybe something that wasn't so obvious at the beginning. Um, so I can activate different sessions. So if I have, so in reality, I think I have about 50 tenants that I work with um, from time to time for different purposes, some uh, kind of throwaway tenants and some not. Um, so there needs to be some kind of way of managing these tenants. How do I switch context a little bit? So Obviously, all of these commands support a set session. So you can say, what commodity session do you want? That doesn't have to be one to one with what tenant it is, but it's basically different credentials. It could be a different maybe settings. Um, so in this example, I have just created two um, profiles. I'm hiding all of the sensitive information, but when you don't have that, you see the host name and everything. Um, but I've configured two users because maybe I have a test user um, that has slightly different permissions and I just kind of want to test it out how that looks sometimes. So you can just select whatever session you want. So I actually have this. Um, so a session is just a JSON file. I also have it encrypted. Passphrase OK. Um, so I have no worries about doing that. Um, so you can see here it's just a JSON file where it says basically your um, somewhere your host name there. Um, my encrypted password, 
and it'll be changing anyway and deleting the user, so don't even try. Um, tenant information, and uh, that's actually auto-populated, so you don't need to specify that. Uh, username and whatever kind of session-specific settings you want to have, but you can also have a global file. Um, so I usually have some sensible defaults in some global file where I say, you know, activate activity log, um, some of my defaults uh, or whatever, encryption, whatever, um, but you then can overwrite them in custom sessions. Um, so you can, if you say, it's a dev system, if I accidentally stand with too much, it's not the end of the world. So maybe I'll change the default delay time to 10 milliseconds, but production systems, again, being conservative, might set that to 250 milliseconds. Um, so it's up to you, highly configurable, um, and you can actually then edit all of this stuff, yes, it from the command line. So I will try to improve to add a bit more of a description there, so you'll get a nice kind of tab um, completion happening there with a description of what it actually does, because there are a lot. Um, but that's also where the documentation website is also good. So I have a uh, generate a, basically all the documentation for all of the API calls. Um, it's auto-generated from the commands themselves. Um, and then, so the documentation website has a mix of, you know, having a bit of a quick demo, what can it do if you want to see kind of the flashy highlights of it, um, installation guide, everything, the concepts. So if we're looking at the activity log, you know, explaining a little bit more of the purpose, why I had done something, um, but working with Commossi for a while now as a um, like API user, um, it's basically everything I've learned over the last five years and trying to bring that in. And um, because there's always been a use case where um, traceability of whatever reason, and you can even see all of the common commands with some examples that you can copy and paste. Here, everything's available. Um, and then with the, the API slash CLI um, commands, each of them are available here on the web to even before you download it or install it or whatever, um, you can kind of have a bit of a probe to see if it's something that you would like or not um, before, yeah, before doing anything. So all of the help here, because it's also in built help and generated from the tool itself, you obviously have um, examples. So the examples shortcut is just to show you examples and nothing else. Um, but it's like any good CLI tool, the help shows you everything. So description, usage, examples, and then all of the flags, and then the global flags. So what's available there. So then I, so we spoke about at the beginning, one of the more motivations was, was being able to automate stuff or very quickly as well. So I've actually prepared a small little script just to show you some of the possibilities and how easy it is. Um, well, let me just see what I have. So simulate. So I just wrote a really dumb script which just starts simulating measurements for devices. It takes an input file. So because Usually, I guess if you're working with files, maybe you want to have a fixed list of devices where you want to generate these um, measurements for. Um, so you just give it a file. So it's run simulate, it's called. Um, it'll just print out nicely to, to the console so you know what you're working with, what's the contents of the files before it actually does something. And then all it does is basically an infinite loop of piping those names continuously to create Create is using that complex JSON uh, file I already had. Um, I'm delaying one second, doing no accept, good citizen again, and having five workers. Cool. So to use that, so first of all, I need my input file. So do I already have one? Yeah. But I believe that might be out of date. So just to be sure, let's go five devices. I only really want the IDs because I need to pipe the IDs. I can do it in different formats, but this also works. Um, so let's just do a CSV. So I won't write it to file, but that's going to be the output. Let's redirect that to input.txt. 
Now all I have to do is then simulate input dot text. Then so let's go last minute. And then I have a random input generator now, which I can, you know, if I was feeling um, or if I wasn't feeling lazy, I could then make the um, interval then configurable from the template when I'm calling the script. But it's because it all plays nicely with good uh, with scripting. Let me just change that to look a little bit prettier. Um, it's it's all available to you, so you can customize it for whatever your your use cases. Um, or if you want to do something a little bit more clever with them templates, and you wanted to um, you know do your own sinusoidal wave or something, you can do that. So it's it's all possible. Um, so that's nice. Maybe another kind of because we can see it coming in, fantastic. Okay, let's just have a look how that looks because REST requests are not the only ones that we can do. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Set session, user one. Measurements, we want to basically, maybe we're a little bit skeptic that it might be sending measurements too quickly, which is always good to be skeptical. Um, so let's subscribe to measurements for this device. Let's um, lay out, let's do 60 seconds, uh, 50, because I've already typed it. Um, we can also limit the counts, say either a bot on 50 seconds or after 10. Let's just say 15. Let's see how it looks. Cool. So I can check, I can even get live input, I can do a dynamic wait and then pipe that later on to a new request or delete the request, and it's all possible. Um, where that works really great with the subscriptions is if you do with some kind of operation and transitioning the state of an operation dynamically. So you can basically subscribe to the operation um, and then update it based, so if the operation is currently in executing, set it to successful or failed, um, or if it's in pending, set it to executing. You can do that all with this tool, um, which makes it very flexible to do ad hoc stuff. Um, because most of the time, you run into a problem and you want to solve it quickly. It won't be the like the the end solution that you want to then give to the customer and say this is in production. Not necessarily because there's some better uh, better ways to do things like with a microservice. So that's kind of a long-term goal. But here we're looking to solve, how do I fix the problem right now? Or how do I kind of investigate the problem and find out a solution and quickly test it, rapid prototyping, to then be able to feed that into my microservice development. So it provides you all of the kind of like the, the groundwork um, that you can just use to better utilize the Comlossia platform and get get out the stuff that you want from it. And, and that's the great thing about Comlossia, it's very flexible, but with the flexibility, um, you have to then know what you're looking for, and this is a great way to kind of experiment stuff. So I hope you've been able to enjoy the demo and you can, you're as excited as I am about it. Um, so it's kind of been a long time coming. I've been developing. Uh, version one was already a year old. Um, however, it's more PowerShell based, but now being supported in the native Go binary, which isn't available for everyone, um, Bash users, Zetshell users, whoever. Um, it's really, I hope the adoption rate will be a lot better. And basically, people can start focusing on the, the, the harder problems and not always how do I send the same request to 100 devices or anything. So it's an open source project um, available online, um, available here, and also linked to the documentation, which will be also provided in the session. So I hope you've enjoyed my session, and I'll look forward to your first uh, feature request on GitHub. Thanks.